If you are listening to this MP3 of the Shape Singers, uh, then you have uh, elected to support my writing and my, my books and my creative work, uh, for which I am deeply grateful. Uh, your support helps me uh, continue to write and hopefully produce more work that is uh, of literary value. Uh, the Shape Singers is a science fiction fantasy story uh, in which I employ some of the uh, uh, tropes and devices of that genre in order to get at the underlying realities of uh, the world we presently live in in 2012, the world of anxiety and seemingly incre incredible chaos and violence. Uh, the music is provided courtesy of MuseOpen.com. Thanks again for your support. The Shape Singers. Laurie was shape singing again. I had told her to stop it, but she wouldn't listen. People in our neighborhood don't like any trouble. They don't like anything too unusual. And they are easily frightened. I told her to stop it a million times. She wouldn't listen. Don't get me wrong, I love music. Terry and I were listening to Benny Carter. Do you want to smoke a joint? She asked. Terry rolled one for herself. You don't mind? I gave her a bleary smile. She licked the joint and lit one end. Benny, Terry said. Benny's the best. I had to agree. It was a 15 minute set from the old days, back when there was real atmosphere. Who's that? Terry asked noting the shift in style. Ben Webster, I said. I listened for the glass falling from the table, breaking on the floor, a tinkly shattering. It was a live recording. I was waiting for Bird's manic riff when the hair stood up on my neck and a shot of adrenaline like formaldehyde burned in my head and eyes. Terry was on her feet and twisting. What in the hell? Terry looked like she wanted to run, but her feet were nailed to the floor. It's nothing, I said, but I could see the strangled look in her eyes. The crumbling in her eyes. That was the one thing about her I hated to see. Terry had beautiful eyes. Excuse me a minute, I'll be right back. I found Laurie on the south balcony. She was just standing there, her hair down one shoulder, torso bare, her arms raised, the palms open. Laurie's eyes were closed, her back arched with her head tilted back slightly as she gave herself over completely to the tantric cacoethes. Concentric waves flowed from her lips and face in little colored rings, slowly dissipating the fundament eroding and altering the atomic skein. For a moment I let the sounds course through me, thrilling every fiber and cell of my frame. It was beautiful in its way. How the shapes just poured out of her. When I opened my eyes, I could feel the crashing like surf ringing in my ears, see the dark formations starting to gather in the west like a cloud of gnats. I touched Laurie's elbow with a delicate finger. The singing stopped immediately as my roommate turned toward me, her jade eyes telegraphing sheer panic. Laurie, there are laws. That was all I said, or needed to say. She covered herself at once, tossing her hair over her shoulder. Singing was tolerated by the authorities, but it had to mean something had to be literal. Anything freeform or non-objective was strictly prohibited. I had to admit there was some justification. The weather patterns were unpredictable enough as it was. Freestyle singing was simply too dangerous. Who needed the additional trauma that shape singing invariably brought with it? Let's go inside, I whispered as gently as I could. 
She pulled away from my arm and brusquely passed into the nether zone of an interior landscape. I could have followed her there, but I was too afraid. Terry had fled by the time I returned. When did you become such a company man? Laurie was sitting at the kitchen table, her hair wet underneath a blanket, her nose to the vapors of a mug of hot Chaldean hibiscus. Her hands wrapped around the ceramic mug as if she were warming them. Darling, I have this little habit, I began sarcastically. You see, I like to eat. Eat this, she said, raising her middle finger in a vulgar salute. I pulled the blanket down to her shoulders and leaned forward, slipping my arms around her and nuzzling her neck with my face. My hands got inside the blanket and smoothed her breasts. I don't want to, she said grumpily annoyed. I withdrew, disappointed. Have it your way. She was still upset. Inside my meditation bubble, I had stopped a grain of sand from falling through the hourglass when I felt another presence. It was Terry. She draped herself around me, drawing me out of myself and into her, her torpor and humidity. Her body was a rainforest in which I could get lost for days. I watched her swimming far above me, poised and balanced like a high-wire acrobat riding a unicycle. Then she toppled and fell, the skin of her shoulder rubbing against mine insistently. Um, she groaned in my ear. We lost our separateness for a time. Later we stood wrapped in our blankets, listening to the crashing of automobiles in the streets far below our eyrie. We watched the carnage, the crimson and chartreuse bleeding into one another, like messy splotches on a painter's palette, the crunching and grinding were continuous, as if some titanic insect were in the process of perpetually devouring and digesting its prey. Finally, the sound of human slaughter was drowned in the cacophony of sirens, and all was buried in the deep blue shadows that succeeded dusk. All this sacrifice, Terry confided in a desperate whisper. What's it for? So that we may live, I replied. Leaning over the railing, Terry folded her arms and rested her chin on her hands. I mean, what's the point? To live, I repeated glumly. There has to be more, she said. I didn't know what she meant. A job collecting images kept me away for weeks. My project manager, Juran, was pleased with my work. These'll feed Moloch for a long time to come. He mentioned a little soiree they were having later that evening. Reluctantly, I agreed to attend. You couldn't be too careful these days. Colors and edges grew soft and diffuse as we merged into the garish lights and dizzying hubbub of the World Casino. We were awash in Broadway show tunes, saccharine and reassuring. I dreamed my way through a glittering melange of gourmet dishes, fine wine, and entertainment. I danced with pert courtesans, paid hostesses of the casino. Life's a party, and you're invited, one breathless demimonde taunted as we rumbud ourselves into dazed exhaustion. Snifters of warm brandy laced with psychotropic aphrodisiacs and vitamins awaited us as we glided back to our table. Colossal multicolored images enveloped us as we were treated to a stupendous floor show. 
Sultry, hermaphroditic voices whispered seductively in our ears, Gaia's fall fashions. Smoky, cascading images of global patina and virtual verdigris, the new terms of art for the slag heaps, nuclear crypts, and contaminated groundwater of industrial pollution and toxic wastes that dotted the landscape on every continent, sang the mercies of progress, sensuous and alluring. Everyone had the same monolithic employer, a shadowy, nameless conglomerate that controlled all the Earth's resources, weapons of mass destruction, and money supply. Oligarchic stability had its benefits, to be sure. Famine, for example, was a thing of the past. There was a trade-off in the wars that sprang up inexplicably as a method of population control. Since the role of national governments had been reduced to that of druggist and travel agent, one seldom questioned the status quo. The poisonous blanket of the atmosphere was repackaged and sold as the chiaroscuro, environment as art object in a personified exotic beauty perfumed with a palpable scent of danger. As long as a citizen's recreational drugs and paycheck arrived each month, no one cared. Oxygen bars sprang up in every city, providing employment in a true growth industry. Thus was the social audit hijacked by free enterprise. The presentation ended with a montage of voluptuous young bodies, choreographed in various stages of progressive undress and writhing in a multiplicity of suggestive poses. The electronic dance music and images dimmed, a trusted patrician voice spoke confidently. Fetal marketing has gone beyond demographics, polls, and surveys. An iconic embryo appeared floating in its amniotic sea, eyes sealed and fingers curled in front of its lips, bringing you the best in social policy and the highest quality of life. We have taken your questions, hopes, and dreams directly to the source. Fetal marketing. Your freedom. Your choice. Your life. These pictures dissolved in a misty rainbow and the lights came up to a level of discreet comfort. I couldn't deny the rosy sense of belonging which the whole thing gave me, or the warm, fuzzy feeling it engendered in my stomach. My buxom consort and rumba partner raised her snifter to mine. World without end, she clucked. I could see from her eyes that her aphrodisiac was taking effect. Amen, I responded. We drained our dregs, and she took my hand, laughing as she led me away to one of the upstairs suites. When I got back to the Erie, I raced to find Lori. She was not present. Two men in long coats and dark suits were there instead. Where's your roommate, Mr... He spoke a name I did not recognize. I knew at once who they were. I said I didn't know where she was, explaining that I had just returned from work. They had no need for further questions. They already knew everything about me. One handed me a card. Give us a call when you hear from her, huh? I nodded and promised I would. With that, the two homesecks vanished. When they had gone, I went to the bathroom and splashed cold water on my face. Regarding myself in the mirror, it suddenly occurred to me that this was a face I scarcely knew. Stringy blonde hair, pudgy face and weak mouth. 
Where was the fellow with the lean jaw and trim physique? Where was Laurie? And Terry? Would they even recognize me? What was going on anyway? I didn't have to wait long. If I was different, Laurie did not remark it. Either she didn't notice or didn't care. I couldn't be sure which. Not that it mattered. Nothing did anymore. Slipping her arms around my portly waist, she hugged me and kissed my mouth. Missed you, she confided. Somehow that balanced the scale of many months. She threw her coat on the divan and set about preparing a simple meal for us both. We ate the seasoned rice and pork dish unhurriedly in delightful silence. Transported by our telepathic rapport, I began to sense the transformation that was overtaking things. In Laurie's face and eyes, I started to understand how the massive buildup of pollutants had triggered recalcitrant nature, releasing transfiguring mutations locked deep in the chromosomes of quantum substance, the interlocking kaleidoscope of elementary particles constituting what we thought of as reality. There was no nature without mind, mind everywhere infusing nature, and both breathed into being by supernal song. The external pictures might change, but the underlying quantum soup remained unchanged. I sat in amazement as we sipped our herbal tea. Thank you, I said. Laurie smiled and went to her room. I sat in silence a long while. On the balcony, I took the card out of my wallet and dialed the number. She's here, was all I said, and turned my cell phone off. While the red sun bled to death in a shower of sparks, I watched the turquoise thoroughfares jammed with gnashing metal teeth. I stood leaning, peering into growing darkness. I sensed an undecipherable shift in the streets below and everything, the crashing machines, the wailing sirens, and the clashing of colors seemed washed away and lost. I hurried inside to find Laurie, but she was no longer in her room. I combed the apartment, too distracted to say her name aloud. My eyes slowly rose to the ceiling, and I stood perfectly still, listening. I flew up the stairs to the roof, and there beneath the settled night looked with astonishment upon the scene. The rooftop was jammed with hundreds of people of all ages and races, their heads tilted back and their eyes closed. Concentric rings of sound flowed from their throats and mouths, merged and melded in the air above their heads and upraised palms, the sky churning with primordial clouds, rippling with protean electric energy. This eclectic multitude shared song rose to a crescendo, a deafening pitch like a tsunami or a hurricane. I saw Terry stripped to the waist, her head and breasts bared to the elements. I stepped forward, taking my place among the others, tilting my head back as I surrendered to the irresistible chorus. The night, the roof, the buildings, and the very streets below all began to dissolve before the dense fog of uh, swirling about us. A squad of homesecs burst upon the roof, but perplexed at the thick murky clouds snaking at their belts, they stopped and lost all interest in us as the fog and the singing rose higher and higher. I closed my eyes as dynamic shapes flooding from my lips and heart and throat unraveled everything in the world disrupting all, reclaiming all. <laughs>